started to get really quiet. Who's ready to get started? Can you all hear me okay? There's a mic for the room. I can use it if I need to, but I'm a loud talker, so I can do this all day. All right. Well, uh, thanks for coming, everyone. This, is, this looks like a really cool group of people. How many of you are all designers in this room? Cool. How many of you are engineers? Nice. How many of you are other? I feel like like a third of the hands didn't go up. Wow. OK, cool, cool. So it's a good mix. Um, well, thanks for coming to the talk. I hope this will have something for everyone. Um, I hope it won't be boring. It might be. Uh, I just wasn't going to talk at all this year. And then like a week ago, I said, ah, it'll be fun to talk. I got to do it. So I scrambled to put these slides together. Um, I started to go like way off course and, and, and blow this thing up. And then I, I scaled it way back down. Um, so we'll see how this goes, but I hope it'll be fun. I'm going to try to, I hear that that's been happening. I'm not going to panic. That's going to come back within a few seconds. Trust. All right. Um, I'm going to try and leave some time at the end here because I do, um, I want to tell a few stories from my experience and I want to maybe get some stories from you all. So no pressure, but if, if anything I'm saying kind of reminds you me of something that you've done in your work or that you've seen out there. I'm going to try and leave some room at the end so uh, folks can share. So look forward to that. Um, first, just a little bit about myself. My name is Andy Kruger. My pronouns are he, him. I went to Prime Digital Academy four years ago. As of this month, actually, was my graduation. Uh, so kind of a later in life transition to this career. And I've been working since then as a UX designer at Datasite. Um, data site's been really great. I'm, I'm sure none of you have heard of it. That's cool. I'm going to go into more of that later. You're going to know all about uh, what we do there. But um, I came in as kind of a, a junior slash associate designer and, and quickly moved up to senior. And now I'm actually managing a team of three designers. So that's been amazing. And I'm also currently the president of UXPA Minnesota. That's the UX Professional Association of Minnesota. So um, just a quick pitch for us. We do uh, an event every month. There have been virtual for the last couple of years, but um, this next month is our annual summer social where we actually get together and have fun. It's really cool. So if you're a member, if your membership's expired, it's a good time to renew it, good time to come out and, and join there. But uh, like I said, I'm going to just start by kind of giving a, a really rough introduction to what it is that I'm thinking about when I have this idea of how, why UX design should be boring. I'm going to tell a few stories that try to illustrate that point, and then I'm going to open it up to the room and hopefully hear more stories from all of you. So um, just going back to the beginning, as I was getting into the UX industry, I was thinking about where do I want to work? When I graduate from Prime, what am I kind of looking at? And I was thinking, well, what, what are some things that I've used that have a good user experience? Because those might be cool things to to work at. I can help and kind of grow on this. So I'm thinking like B2C. I'm thinking consumer stuff that I use. And you know, be really Apple, of course, Apple, like think of design, they're they're huge up there. I'm probably not gonna go there right away, but locally, well I've got some uh, like retail and, and customer experience background. So maybe something like, like like Amazon's got an office here or Target or maybe even Best Buy here they got a really cool corporate headquarters. That might be a fun place to work. And it what turns out happened is I got, um, I interviewed with this company called Datasite. Actually, at the time, it was called Merrill Corporation. We've rebranded since then. Um, oh, yeah, and quick thing, uh, actually, I wanted to kind of ask, has anyone heard of Datasite other than you, Gotham? I work with you. You don't count for this. But OK, a few people have heard of it. Great. Ah, Mara's here, too. Hi. Um, so some of my coworkers showed up to, to support me. Thank you. Um, but yeah, we're, we're actually a pretty big, successful international company, but we're, we're not very well known in the Twin Cities. So um, it turns out. And when I first heard about what we do, SaaS provider for bankers and M&A transactions, I looked at their website. I was reading about it. I said, well, that sounds really boring. <laughs> but you know, a job's a job. I got to get my foot in the industry. Let me take a shot. And you know, it turns out it's, this has been an incredible job um, because it's not really about the product. It's about the process. That's what we do every day. That's what makes us happy and fulfilled and, and, and how we grow. So um, th th that's kind of that's at the root of sort of what I was thinking about was that um, as, as professionals, whether we're engineers, designers, 
um, working on these digital experiences, a lot of what we do, it's not, it's not that it's that thrilling, um, that it's something that we do just for fun in our spare time necessarily, but it is really important, it is really valuable to the companies we work for and to the users that we're making these uh, experiences for. And it's that, that fun of solving problems is what at, at least fuels me and I think a lot of my peers as well. So as long as we're doing that, um, it can be exciting even though kind of looking at it, thinking about it from the outside, it seems like, well, that sounds kind of boring, um, but it's not. So like, if it wasn't clear, I'm using the word boring kind of tongue in cheek here, right? Like um, it, it's, it's, it's the so-called boring work um, in UX that I, that I think is so important versus sort of what a lot of people might tend to think about from the outside is what UX is. Um, and, and it being this like sexy, exciting, uh, amazing thing when a lot of the work really is, is very um, just run of the mill, brick laying, foundation building stuff. And I really saw this when I came into DataSite at first. I was placed on a team with primarily back-end engineers. They'd never worked with the UX designer before. And so they weren't mean about me joining the team. They were like, hey, cool, nice to have you. But they didn't know what I was there for, really. Um, and when I started to sit down with some of them and talk, and they said, well, you're just here to like, make decisions about what color the buttons are and stuff, right? And I said, no, actually, I don't care what color the buttons are. First of all, I don't have a visual design background. That's not where I come from. If DataSite changes the color of their buttons one day, cool, I'll change the color of the buttons. It doesn't matter. Um, but what I really do care about uh, for you with the value to you as an engineer on the team is that we're going to make sure we're building the right things off the bat so that you don't have to go back and redo anything and so that you understand the value of what we're building. You're getting involved with these conversations with clients so that uh, you can actually see how what you're building is having a tangible impact in their lives. And it was like a light bulb went off, just seeing the eyes light up when I described this. Um, it was actually perfect timing because we were on this project where uh, that wasn't happening at all. And then there was a big disconnect between, well, why am I even doing this? And the definitions are changing of what we're trying to build. And, and it wasn't clear. So getting them involved in that process was, was really huge. And once they understand what UX was and how we work, that became a part of their role going forward. That became something that they were looking for. Um, moving forward is having that understanding where before they've been happy to just say, well, just, just tell me, I'm the engineer, just tell me what to build and I'll build it. Um, th suddenly that was not enough. So um, th that's, that's the kind of boring, boring thing that we do uh, is <laughs> advocate for UX, bring people into this process of talking to clients and understanding value. So I'm going to tell three other stories here. Um, and again, you know, these are about things that resulted in an amazing user experience. But it's, when, you, when you look at it, you wouldn't go, wow, incredible UX, this is amazing. It's got all these animations and colors and lights and buttons that pop off the page. But it, it is a great purpose-built solution to a problem that exists that brought value to the people who use it and the companies where they were made. Um, the first one is by Jared Spool. It, this one's got a name. It's called the $300 million button. This is based off a, a, an article he wrote. Again, just quick show of hands. Has anyone heard this story before? Oh, oh man, one person I think is the only hand I saw. So the rest of you are so lucky because you're going to hear this story. Um, this is something that I heard when I was first getting into UX, and it's really stuck with me because this is quintessentially a story about how uh, what seems like just a tiny, tiny little change makes a big impact because it's the right change. It's the correct thing to do, and they found it after talking to users. And so the scenario here was that Jared was hired to come in and work for this $25 billion e-commerce site. He doesn't say who it is. He doesn't uh, show what it looked like, but I mocked up a little uh, thing of what it might look like because he describes it just had these two fields, this little link for if you forgot your password, and these two buttons. And the problem that this company was seeing, the reason that they brought him on was to look at what's happening. People are filling their shopping carts, they're getting here, they're not completing their purchase. Why is that? And so what they did was they brought in some people that were like typical users that this company would work with. They gave them some money and they just sat down and watched them. And they said, now all you have to do is complete a purchase. Just have to buy something from here. And what they found was that people were not super stoked to create a account with this company. And um, even if they, uh, they thought they didn't, they thought, well, maybe I have already registered. They couldn't remember. That was kind of frustrating. And they thought, well, the only reason that this company wants me to register anyway is they're probably going to sell my name to some list or they're going to spam me with marketing or whatever. I don't want to do it. And what was interesting was that the site actually wasn't asking anything during registration that it didn't already need to know to complete the purchase. So it, this was perceived as really egregious 
Um, and, and in fact, there was a process that the company needed to complete in either case, but they were forcing this registration to do it. And then they tested with repeat customers too, and it was not really any better. A lot of people stumbled on this form, uh, tried to log in multiple times, couldn't remember their username and password. I don't know if that resonates with anybody here, but, um, and then when it turned out, when they looked at the data after doing these tests, that almost half of these customers, half the customers that existed that were registered had more than one registration in the system, which blows my mind that there's that many people that had already registered once and then came back to purchase again either couldn't remember their password or forgot what it was, and they went ahead and created a whole second account and didn't even realize it. And, and most of the users who pr were pretty sure that they had a registration forgot their password and said, please send me that. Most of them never, ever came back to complete the purchase. So those sales were just completely lost. So, so here's the cool thing. What did they do? UX. <laughs> they changed, they had a button, and they changed a little bit of text. They said, we're not gonna require you to register. You don't have to register. You can do that later on if you want, but you can just continue. And, and this teeny, tiny little change that doesn't look like anything, right? It increased the number of orders by 50%. In the first month, that equated to $15 million in revenue. It was $300 million over the first year. And you think about what it cost to make this change. They didn't have to commission illustrations. They didn't have to make a bunch of new animations or videos or anything. They just changed a button and they changed the flow a little bit. And it made such a huge difference. So I love it. I love it. That kind of story, uh, you know, you look at it and it's like, if you don't know the background, you, you look at that and go, well, so what? Why'd they make the change? I don't care. This, this is what UX does. We're paying them too much. But when you see the impact, when you see the results, then you, you understand what the value is that's being brought here. So I just get really excited about it. I geek out about it. I hope some of you at least do, because I, I want to hear more stories like this. I just think that they're really fun. Uh, and they don't get enough airtime, in my opinion, which is why I wanted to give this talk. Because you do hear about like the really cool big name UX stuff when they come out with some big experience, some whole new browser release or whatever. It's like that gets a lot of news. This stuff I don't hear about as much as I'd like. So the next two stories are about stuff that I've done at Datasite. And before getting into it, I want to give you just the bare minimum uh, about what we do for a little bit of context to help make these make a little more sense. Um, Essentially, what we are is a secure file sharing platform. The way that it works is if a company wants to sell, they negotiate with a bank. That bank comes to us. They say, we'd like a data site diligence project. We say, OK, cool. We got a contract. Here's your project. They go in there. They get all the files that have to do with what the company is doing. They put them on this platform. And then they organize them, do a bunch of other stuff with them. And eventually, they set permissions for the buyers, if there's more than one. And then they invite those buyers into the platform so that they can look at all the stuff. This is the due diligence phase of an M&A transaction. And um, it's happening all the time. The Activision Blizzard deal recently um, was one that went through our platform. So um, those companies were on data site, sharing those files, having conversations about um, what we're going to do for this deal. So. Um, Four years ago, we had just pretty much just released our new platform, more or less, or at least we were still in the process of converting existing clients and projects over onto this new platform. And we thought the new platform was really cool. It was um, replacing an old one that was kind of out of date. This one was very much more uh, user friendly. It, it looked nicer. It was easier to use and understand. And we wanted to move everyone over there. Of course, we also wanted to shut down the old one. We didn't want to pay for it anymore. And we didn't want to have to support it or anything else. And so we were looking at what, why aren't people uh, switching over? And the main reason was we had this watermarking tool on the old one. And it had all these features because, of course, over the years and years and years, it had accrued all, all of these features. And it was hard to, to just make them all go away. People were saying, well, we need some of that stuff. And so what we wanted to find out was, well, what exactly do they need? Because it was a lot. Uh, we looked at the old experience there on the top. This is the platform that uh, those users were still on compared to the new one on the bottom. So the old one had these 13 available fields of all these different information types. And you could put them in five different places on the page. And you could set the opacity. And you could set the font size. So super flexible. And the new one we had, uh, oh, and I forgot to mention, Every single user that they had, so every single one of those buyers or those buyers' uh, advisors or whatever, they could give them a different watermark. So they could all be customized. 
Um, and the new one, everyone gets the same watermark, and we have two fields and one that's on there all the time. That was it. And you could turn it on or off. And, and so we thought, well, this could be a really big effort, but let's talk to our users and find out and see what's going on. And before we talked to them, we, did, we looked at the data. We said, OK, what's being used? And we could see, first of all, you know, a lot of these options, those, those multiple fields that we had, they weren't really being used that much. OK, that's good to know. Um, but some of the stuff was really being used. They were, um, in particular, creating a lot of different watermarks for all these different users. Um, and, and they were different in some way. We could see that they weren't just using the same settings for everyone. They were using different ones. So we thought, well, why is that? And so um, sales was really helpful here. They hooked us up with the clients who were the ones complaining. They're saying, we need these features. So we were talking to the actual users who had said, we need better watermarking stuff before we're going to convert. So these are the people we needed to convince. And we did this exercise called the five whys, where you just ask <laughs> again and again and again, like a, like a child, well, why? Why do you need watermarking? Well, why is that important to you? Why, why, why? Um, and it sounds really dumb, but it's really great because it gets you down to these core needs and values uh, that someone has around something. And what we heard was, well, these are super secure financial transactions. And these documents that we're sharing, if they get out, that's like big. That can cost a lot of money. And of course, they might get leaked. You can't do anything about that. But if they do, we need to identify the company that did it. Because guess what? We're going to sue them. So we need to know who that was. And that's what's important to us. And so. We had that information in hand, and we looked again at this old experience. And now, suddenly, actually, this didn't look so great. Because through the lens of these users using it, they're saying, you know, all I really care about is the company name and the email. And by the way, why do I care about the email? Because the domain usually has the company name in it. I don't even care about the person. I just care about the email they're using, because that helps me identify exactly how this leak occurred. <laughs> and the problem is that I only need these two things. But I can't do that in an automated way. I have to create a watermark for every single user that I have on this project. This could be dozens or even hundreds of users in extreme cases for the really big deals. And I have to manually write in their name and their email address for it to appear on the watermarks. That's the only way I can do it. And by the way, I don't care where that information goes or what this watermark looks like, but you're making me pick. You're making me choose one of the places on this page. I don't care. It's just a watermark. Put it wherever you want. And so when we looked at this and we thought um, about what we could do to fix it, and we brought them back an idea. And we said, what if we add two checkboxes, company name and email, and you can tick those off when you set up your watermarks, when you start your project. And what we're going to do is whenever someone goes and looks at a document or downloads it, we're gonna, we already have that information. It's in our database. We know who all the users are. So we'll just put their company name and their email on there. And so if it gets out, you'll know who it was. And that solved all the problems. So, they didn't need us to recreate all those fields. They didn't need us to recreate all those placement options. And in fact, we were able to do something that was way less work than we anticipated with data that we already had and make a better experience by far. Because this isn't adding any value to their lives. It's just keeping them from the real core of what they're trying to do. And this way, they can just, they can just set it and forget. And they're done. And they can move on. And they loved us for it. So with that, we were able to address most of the requests. Of course, there were, there were outliers. There were some other things that people did still want, but they were just nice to haves. And we got to them <laughs> over the years. We started, we've been adding more. It's getting more advanced. Um, but we were able to convert all these projects. That's $20 million worth in revenue. And we were able to shut that old project down and move all those resources over to the new one. So uh, big success for us with uh, a very small amount of effort. Just understanding what the users were really trying to do was all we needed. OK, so last story, and then I'll turn it over um, to you all. And in this case, I'm, I'm making that initial uh, description of what we do a little more complex, because you know, surprise, it's a little bit more complicated than what I said at first. Um, it, it turns out that um, when the selling company talks to this bank, and this bank starts collecting all this information from the sellers, um, they don't come right into our project and start working, because um, they're not going to sign a contract with us to open a project until they're pretty much 100% sure that this deal is going to be done. And so there's this pre-diligence phase where they're already talking to the bank. They're gathering all these files, hundreds, thousands of files together. And then when it's time to start that diligence phase, <clears throat> that's when they call data site and they say, OK, open the project, and I'm going to put stuff here. So the problem in this case was that these bankers were using third-party tools like Dropbox, Box, Google Drive, whatever, or they were using their email nightmare to <laughs> manage all this stuff and organize it, um, or just to, like some internal tool. 
And they said, you know, we really would rather do it on data site from the beginning. We like your tool. It's great. And we're going to have our stuff there eventually anyway. Can you help us out? And we said, yeah, we think we can do something about that. We could maybe make a new prod, uh, product type. And you could just put stuff there. And then when it comes time to convert, you can just move it all over. So I was in charge of uh, creating a whole new product. How exciting. Now is the chance. Now we're going to make this big, sexy, cool UX thing. And I'm going to be famous and write a Medium article about it. Um, so we did this design sprint, which is really cool. Uh, for those who don't know, design sprint um, is just a, a method for really quickly um, building and testing a prototype with users and figuring out what you want to do next. And, and so we were thinking, yes, this, this is awesome. We've got all these ideas about what we might do differently. This is our chance to revolutionize the M&A industry and disrupt and all that stuff that everyone wants to do. And so we talked to our clients and we said, here's all our big ideas about how we could do this deal prep stuff that you need to do. And the, then you can convert into our platform. And isn't this great? And they said, no. <laughs> no, thank you. We don't want that. We, we like your product. We already have everything that we need there. Don't change anything. This is not broken the way that it is. We just We would really prefer that it's consistent. Because when we're, we're doing our work, of prep, and then we're converting over to diligence, it, we can't have stuff be suddenly different. I, I don't want to relearn it, how, how to work something different. And, and I, I want to know when I'm doing prep that where I put everything, and what I call it, and how I invite users and everything is, is the same, so that uh, there's no difference. I do want to know which one I'm in, but that's about it. And, and by the way, for the designers or anyone who talks to users out there, is it just me, or is it a little bit frustrating sometimes when you talk to people and they say, no, it's great, don't change anything? <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's, it's good. That's like, well, that's really great. I'm glad you love us, but we're here to fix problems, so please give us problems to fix. Um, and in this case, the only problem that we really had was um, just how to do this effectively. And so, you know, we did ask them why, and, and I, kind of, I just told you why. You know, they, they wanted something that um, would just really easily transition from one to another. So, Unlike in the last scenario where we asked people, what are you trying to do? And they were saying, well, we, we want what we had before, because that was what they were familiar with. right? That's, that's what they knew. They said, we need to be able to set these watermarks for every individual user. When we gave them a better way to do it, they were happy with it. In this case, when we talked to them and we understood what they were trying to do, we looked at it. We said, you know what? In this case, they're 100% they're correct. Of course, you want that to be the same from one to the other, because you're not. it's not like you're on two different total platforms, you're just kind of transitioning from one state to the other. So we, we gave it a different color. We gave it a different name for this different phase. And we just removed a few options. We removed some things that, we, that they didn't need um, for the prep that they would need for diligence so that they would actually pay us <laughs> when it came time uh, to do that part. But they could get into this prepare part for free. And we, we just told them, here's what we're going to do. You can get this prepare project whenever you need. There's no strings attached. When you're ready to sign a contract, you can just press a button to convert it. It's going to flip over. Everything's the same. We give you the functionality that you need. And you know, if you choose to not use Datasite at that time, if for whatever reason you need to use one of our competitors, no problem. You can export everything. We hope you'll choose us next time, but we're not going to put some goofy impediments in your way because we know that that's going to prevent you from using it. And, and they loved it. It was great. It was a great fit. And, and we won even industry awards for it. And, um, and this felt weird <laughs> to me. Um, now, to be fair, like the awards were not just for, for the design. They were for prepare. Um, and so some of them were, were for the cool machine learning stuff that we had or other neat features that we had. But um, you know, the fact was that I was the lead designer behind this product. And I'm seeing data site prepare wins such and such award and thinking that's, that's a little weird. Because we didn't do anything that seems really uh, revolutionary here. Um, but we did talk to our users and find the perfect solution for what they were trying to do. And I think that, that that should be celebrated more. I think that we should talk more about those kinds of stories where when you look at the end result, it, it's not necessarily something that's going to impress anyone or surprise anyone uh, or even anyone would necessarily care about. Um, but it's, it's made this big impact. It's really helped out. Um, it means that we did a great job, and our users are happy, and our company's happy. So that's all I have to say. Um, and I thought, well, we could do Q&A, but that's 
kind of boring. I don't have anything more to say about this stuff, really. If you want, if you want to talk more about the details of, of data site and these stories, come talk to me afterwards. That's cool. Um, but I really, really would love to hear from the group if there's anything that any of you all have to share on this topic. I put up some suggestions for, um, for prompts here. Um, thinking about maybe the products that you use, what's, what's something that maybe doesn't look like much, but it made a big difference in your life. Could be a button changed, could be some text change, where it's like, oh, suddenly this makes sense. I see, I see a hand up, by the way. I'm going to get to you. I'm just going to read through these really quick. Um, or you know, just been, been surprised to find something that was simple worked when you thought you needed something more complicated um, or, or made a big impact like this. I'm also wondering, um, whether, for those of you who are designers or who work with designers, whether you've ever had the kind of misunderstanding that I did between um, what UX actually does and what it's maybe perceived as doing or the more visible part of our work and how you overcame that. So I, I saw someone's hand up. Yes, you go ahead. That's awesome, thank you. I've turned on the microphone because I like to shout, but I'm not gonna make you all do it. Thank you for being the first. I'm gonna pass it over here. I'm gonna move this around as people volunteer. Thank you. So I have a really life-changing experience with uh, mobile keyboards. So when you're, try when you're typing really long sentences on your phone, you know how frustrating it is to go back to a just change an alphabet mm. in the middle of a sentence. How you know it, it, you get frustrated, right? So I think when mobile keyboards were first introduced, 2008, 2009, 2010, they were evolving. And I, at this point of time, I was in India, and we were with a group of friends. We were just trying to create a product uh, to easily move the cursor, just use arrow keys or whatever, and then eventually we found out that your mobile keyboard already does that. <laughs> so if you long press your space bar, you can try it out right now if you have not already. Long press your space bar on your mobile keyboard, it turns into a trackpad. And then you can swipe on your keyboard to move your cursor anywhere you want on the sentence you are typing. So that, that totally changed my mind. We didn't have to build anything, just long press the space bar. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Simple solution, but not easily discoverable. Yeah. <laughs> Work to be done there. Anyone else? Yeah, I'll come to you. And if you don't mind uh, saying your name and where you work, if that's applicable to the story. Sure. Uh, hey, I'm Donnie. Um, the story's from when I was a docker and not a company called Percona on set. Um, what we did was kind of like your checkout story from earlier, where we were having a lot of challenges with new users onboarding, and they just wouldn't go all the way through it. They wouldn't even get as far as our software first because we have you know, web app, we also have a desktop application. Uh, so we tried to get them to sign up for an account on our website before they would download and install the software. And they just didn't have enough motivation, they didn't have a reason yet. And so we then rethought that flow and put the sign up inside of the desktop application at the very end of their onboarding mm -hmm. tutorial. And then they said, hey, I've seen value, but I can't actually publish the code I'm working on until I have an account that I can share it in Docker Hub. And so had a massive increase in signups as a result of it. Cool. Thanks. I think I saw someone as I ran by. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm Christina Adams. I'm a digital accessibility software engineer. And so this simplified UX like speaks to my heart <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, because so many times I've had to talk designers, UXers out of like, oh, we're going to make this a drag and drop. Mm -hmm. And how do you do drag and drop accessibly for somebody who's using assistive technology? Incredibly difficult, right? So 
I really appreciated um, the example, the, the um, what was it, 300 million? 300 million. Million dollar button. Yeah, because I can, I can tell you times that I've witnessed this happen with a user on a screen reader trying to fill out a mm -hmm. form that didn't, they didn't really have to do. And they get frustrated and they just go somewhere else. Right. Um, so there was like a, a thought from one of those businessy articles to like justify the value of this. And they're like, please stop trying to delight your users. <laughs> like, yes. Your users are trying to do something efficiently. Right. Like make it efficient. Mm -hmm. right? So yeah, I, I appreciate this talk a lot. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I originally had some slides on accessibility, and I forgot to mention that, but yeah, so important. Yeah. Um, anyone else? Yeah. This may be a dumb question, but since you're all here, um, UX versus BA versus QA roles. So for QA, instead of like testers, QC, which is like, did we do the job right? I think of QA as did we do the right job, mm -hmm. which fits in with your UX. But like, how do people work on teams with these different roles still? And like, how do you distinguish between UX, BA, QA? I'm not sure how I would answer that. I, um, I mean, the, I, the main uh, dichotomy that we talk about with UX and development in general, or engineers in general, is that as an engineer, you're um, like a systems expert, you're a technical expert. You know how to build the thing right, right? Um, and, but the UX's job is to b figure out how, which is the right thing to build <laughs> so that we're, we're actually working on something that's gonna be useful. Um, I, that, I guess that's the main difference in my mind. I don't know if that helps or if that really answers the question, but. Have you ever worked with BAs as well? And mm -hmm. then. What, what's a BA? Yeah, what, oh, can you say more about that? Uh, uh, Just business, uh, is it business, business analyst? analyst. Okay. And, and so typically like they are writing functional specs or they may even list like non-functional requirements um, for, the, for the system, uh, you know, performance, scalability, et cetera. Okay. Uh, but typically, yeah, it's the, the features and the language of the system, mm. you know, the nouns and verbs of the system. But I also feel like that's a bit of, of UX as well. And then QA is like, did we, measuring, was this really the right thing right. as well? Yeah. Oh, great. Go ahead. Well, I am a BS business Perfect. <laughs> and a UX and accessibility specialist. So my prior job, at, um, I did wear, um, I actually wore a lot of hats. So I was the BA, the UX, usability research, all of the jazz, <laughs> usability testing and all of that. Yeah. And then I also wore the hat of a tester. So I mm. did have um, like dedicated testing team, like a testing team. But I also tested it prior before it got to them. Because with my, um, I guess, maybe like just the customer view, I can test it and make sure that we are building the right thing for our customers before we send it over to QA that can test it that it's actually functional, yeah. that it meets the requirements. So I don't know if that answers your question. Oh, okay. But oh. yeah, there, there are teams that have BA, QA separately and UX separately, mm -hmm. but yeah. with the team that I was on, I was both BA and, Q and, and um, UX. Is it more customer focused? It's both, okay. <laughs> it's just the hard part. So we are customer focused, working with um, the, the customers to really identify what it is that they need. Um, and in my perspective, our customer were um, our business folks and the public. Mm -hmm. So I worked for a government agency. So then, which is no one wants to test for government. <laughs> so it was really hard to get um, public testers. And then you have to speak the language of the developers, which mm -hmm. I know most yes. of you guys in here are. So then that's the hard part that BA and UX have to kind of sit in between. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks, Edith. This is why I love Minibar. I knew someone would have the answer to that question. She was right here. Um, anyone else have a story to tell? I'm going to come over. Actually, I'll start here because I'm here, and then I'll come over to you. Go ahead. OK, hi, I'm Larry. Um, I'm actually this would be like a customer feedback and uh, how the customer, how the businesses pay attention to the customer's feedback. I'm just actually going to go for my emails. Uh, <laughs> so it's a Moonshot t-shirts. I don't know if you've ordered, but they have some kind of cool t-shirts. So I ordered three t-shirts from them, right? And the response I got from them back, I received one t-shirt of the three. 
And the response was, the eagle has landed. The last of the items from the last of the items from your order, three, three, whatever, have now been delivered. I'm like, I got two, one t-shirt, dude. Where's my other two t-shirts, right? This is crazy, right? So then I sent them, then like four days later, I received the other two t-shirts. Okay. I sent them a response because I was just giving them feedback on that distressing email. They said, I said, <laughs> this should not be the email response when you only send part of an order saying it was totally complete. Please correct this so others are not confused like I was. And their response was, hey Larry, looks like the other two t-shirts were delivered yesterday. <laughs> Factual. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, my name is Eric. I work at Caribou, and I just wanted to give a quick testimonial to the importance of the five why. Mm. Um, so, you know, UX. We talk a lot about being customer facing, but even within your company, there are situations where you're the UX between multiple departments. So we had a situation where our fulfillment team, which takes the order and puts it in the mail, and the marketing team had this really complicated change management process where if they wanted to change the title of a product, multiple people had to communicate, yada, yada, yada. It's like, this is just like e-com. We solved this 20 years ago. <laughs> um, but when doing the five whys, what we found out was that apparently alphabetical order mattered because the fulfillment process, they were used to running a report that everything printed out in alphabetical order, and so when they put it on the shelf, they sorted it in alphabetical order. So in marketing, decided to change the name from like polo fleece to buffalo plaid, well, it went from left side to the right side. And in doing the five whys, we said, well, why don't we sort it by skew? It's like, well, we didn't know you had that option. Uh -huh. So just in changing a single report, we're now everything like sorted by the skew, which is the easiest piece they have, Fulfillment went faster, marketing was able to add what we want, and the developers didn't have to do six pieces of functionality just because we asked, why does sorting matter? Yeah. So I like, love the five why, and you can't do it enough. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Isn't it great when people talk to each other? <laughs> <laughs> Especially people that have the information that they need to solve each other's problems. Any other stories? Yeah. Let's sit back here. My name is Jessica. Uh, I just started from college two weeks ago. Um, oh, yeah. So I was working on building an e-commerce website uh, to sell artworks, and hmm. I was building it on Square, uh, Squarespace. Uh, people are familiar with it. Uh, and it was very simple. It had a landing page with an About Us, uh, and then a shop, a shop page. Uh, but then when I was looking at the stack, nobody click like there are only two percentage that clicks on the shop page mm. and then when i look into it i realize that most people check them check the website out on their mobile and with squarespace they only have a little tiny bottom <laughs> there for you to choose to a different page mm -hmm. um so after i realized that i just add another like another option on my landing page to like you can shop with us. Mm -hmm. And it increased, like everyone after that can visit, like the increased percentage to like 50% of people actually yeah. click on the neck, uh, like the shop page. Cool. All right. All right, thanks for sharing that. Anyone else? This is fun, right? I love this. Hi, right, thanks. I actually have kind of a question. Um, uh, so I'm a student, I'm just about to finish, I'm just starting the job search right now. Um, and uh, it's for software engineering. Um, so I've heard that working as a software engineer, it's actually frequently kind of a luxury to be able to have a close working relationship with the UX person. Mm. Um, so I was wondering uh, if there are other engineers in the room, um, if you're in that kind of situation, what are some sort of tips for if you sort of have to make those decisions on your own while you're working? Ooh. Yeah, that's a great question. Any engineer want to take that? <laughs> Make friends with somebody in the marketing department. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, get get to know the UX people at the organization too. I would say if you have the opportunity, because if if we know that there's, we'll we'll help <laughs> if we can, right? Um, rather than have you just have to make a guess. 
I think a lot of UX people would say, yeah, I'll make time to give you some input. Was someone over here volunteering? <laughs> we don't know each other. <laughs> um, so several years ago, we launched a new platform for a different type of customer. And when we started that process, we did not really include UX at the beginning. They were a bolt-on mm. at the end of our development process to bug check, all this kind of good stuff. And um, accessibility was not even really a consideration. So. About a year into the project, that kind of flip-flopped, where we started with UX and accessibility, and that became kind of the guiding light for our development team to implement things that didn't cause bugs, <laughs> <laughs> hundreds of bugs, um, down the line to be tested and, and fixed. So mm. I'll just say, include UX early, often, and accessibility as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. I think one of the, the misperceptions that's out there still is that including UX increases time, right? And, and is a barrier, but I think in most cases it can actually find problems earlier uh, before they become an issue and get you on the right track sooner. At least that's how it should work. All right, I'm coming back to you. Apologies, try not to take over the discussion. <laughs> I, I used to be in engineering, I'm now in product management. Um, one of the things that's really useful when you don't have access to UX is try and figure out how you can self-serve some of that stuff. Like if they don't have time to partner with you on a project, maybe they can have one upfront kickoff meeting and then mm. give you a design system and some components and some principles so that you can then you know, do an 80% job at least, even if you can't get the last 20 without the UX team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually at Datasite, um, I'm a dedicated UX lead on a couple of teams, but I kind of pinch hit for a couple of others so that don't usually need a UX resource, but occasionally do, and I'll, I'll come in and help out. So that, that's a model that can work. Any other answers to that question, stories, or additional questions for this group? If not, we can just end early and go hang out and play video games. That's cool, too. Oh, I got one more. I mean, y'all are free to leave at any time and go play video games. Right? It's, it's an unconference. If this is boring, you can go. Whoop. I just uh, want to share a quick story about I'm a big fan of low-tech solutions. And I, years ago, built a fantasy sports website called Unbenchable. And I'm a competitive ultimate frisbee player. Nice. And I wanted to do it. I wanted to do a fantasy game around the national championship and talking to the national governing body about collecting all of the stats of all of the players was pretty difficult. Hmm. And they were collecting it all and they, were, they had volunteers in every field writing all of the stats on paper and talking to the national governing body. I was asking them when they were going to digitize it and do everything around that so I could collect the information. But it was going to turn out that it was going to be like a two to three week lag between hmm. them collecting the information, publishing it, and then putting it in the fantasy sports app, which wasn't really going to be very usable. <laughs> so I contacted all of the captains of all of the teams at the tournament, and I asked them after the game to go take a photo hmm. of the paper sheet and text it to me. And I hired somebody on Fiverr for $20 to actually just go transcribe all of the data. Nice. <laughs> they put it in a spreadsheet the same day, every single day for me. And I ended up sending the spreadsheet to the national governing body. <laughs> and I was able to fulfill wow. the fantasy sports app uh, and day to day. Nice. Yeah. I hope they were reimbursing your Fiverr expenses yeah. too, at yeah. least. You're selling that, right? Yeah. Okay, good. Cool. Anyone else? These are great stories. I love it. Um, I will say, originally, I did have some slides on um, the, the 10 usability heuristics. And I skipped them because I wanted to um, really refocus on, on this. But that's something else to look at if you just want kind of general usability guidelines that can be assessed without even necessarily having access to users. They're a great way of identifying problems and being pointed towards potential solutions. Who are the big names in usability right now? <sighs> yeah, um, yeah, and that's, that, that's the Nielsen-Norman group um, that publishes that. Yeah, Don Norman for sure. 
um, and um, Jared Spool uh, is okay. one who I, I mentioned here. Um, but I mean, there's so many. It's, it's a really a, a great time that there are so many folks in UX uh, out there sharing their, their knowledge and wisdom with the rest of us. Anyone else? I don't know how much more time we got. I think we're just about done with the session. Anyway, so this seems like a good time to wrap it up and just say thanks, everyone, for your contributions and your participation. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon.